all people are when you manifestations obey God's word of that was built by the slaves, total reality. And I watch my daughters. There is nobody that respects women more than I do. There's a lot of crisis, a lot of bad. This. Hey everybody, welcome to this podcast, the podcast where we deconstruct the stories that cause us suffering in order to become more fully present to this. And I'm sorry for the silence. It's been a little while since I've released a podcast. Uh, It's been crazy. My book came out a few weeks ago and it's also called This becoming free. And you know, I, I'm not great at naming things apparently because this is not a word you can just type in and find <laughs> this within very easily. So you got to usually search for my name, Michael Gunger. Um, but anyway, it's so exciting to have this book finally out in the world. Um, I've been hearing such wonderful, lovely stories from a lot of you who have been reading it or who have read it already and who it's impacting. Thank you for sharing those stories with me. Thanks for sharing with others online. It's been really cool to finally have it in the world. A lot of work in that book. So glad you're enjoying it. Today's episode's a little different. It's not going to be able to be the full produced edited thing that it usually is. It's super late and I'm about to go on another tour tomorrow. I just got done with a tour with my band Gunger, my old band Gunger. It's funny to say now. Um, It was the final tour. We just got done with that. And I'm getting ready to head out on another couple dates tomorrow with my friend Science Mike from the Liturgists on a tour called Tabs and Wafers, which uh, I bet if you like this podcast, you'll, you'll like that tour. You can check out those tour dates at theliturgists.com. But this episode today is going to be a little different because I'm out of time (laughs) to get one done. But you've been asking some really good questions on Twitter and Mastodon, and I just wanted to answer some of those questions today. I won't have time to get to all of them. Uh, There's a bunch of really good ones, and I'll plan on doing more of these episodes where I answer more of those questions. But I thought I'd at least let you know that this is still here, that this podcast is continuing beyond the release of the book, this. They go together like everything else. And uh, okay, so let's get into a couple questions. Twitter, Ryan Shaw asks, as someone who struggles with weight, how do I go about enjoying this while simultaneously striving and being motivated to be in better shape and be healthier? I've always used shame as my method of control, but I see after your book how that just causes suffering. Thank you for your question, Ryan. We all have these things, right? These stories that have been told to us about who we should be, what we should look like, how much we should weigh, what we should believe, what kind of sexuality we should have, all sorts of stories about how we should be different than we are. And so right from the beginning of your question, Ryan, is the suffering. I've been struggling with my weight. And right in there is is the suffering. You mentioned that you've used shame to try to control your weight. And I totally relate. Um, I have a a family who's not skinny. (laughs) None of my family members are, are uh, would be called thin um, and strangely even in that context with a full-bodied family 
uh, fatness was always kind of shamed. It was made fun of, laughed at. Remember my grandmother, who was this spicy Puerto Rican lady, was quite cruel about it, really, honestly. You know, I remember a fat woman backing up in a grocery store and her making like a beep beep sound. Um, not cool, Grandma. But that was the culture that I lived in. We lived in Wisconsin, a lot of big people, a lot of corn-fed people in Wisconsin, dairy-fed folks. And um, so I developed an aversion to gaining weight myself. I was pretty skinny as a kid and even into adulthood, but there was always kind of this shame behind it. Like, I can't get fat. I can't get fat. And um, what I talked about on a recent podcast was my habit that I developed of poking my belly and always kind of trying to take stock and make sure that I was feeling okay by checking on my weight. And you are certainly right that shame as a method of controlling weight is suffering. But I would argue that the suffering that you're experiencing is rooted far before you even get to that part of it. Certainly, yes, the shame makes it even worse. But the you thinking that you are this body that needs to be a different kind of body. That's the suffering. That's the root of it. Whether you use shame or pride or freaking hypnosis or whatever you're doing to manage the problem, the fact that you see a problem with who you are is where the suffering is. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean to not suffer means just be unhealthy. Like you just got to dig into the butterfingers and there's the secret to your happiness. <laughs> Although I do like a butterfinger. Um, Ryan, here's the deal. We human beings are a pattern of this, of the all, that have been conditioned to tell stories. It's help us survive together. And part of these stories includes idealism, includes standards of beauty and morality and righteousness and all sorts of stories. And those are necessary for holding up standards in society that we can all use as matrices of meaning, as standards to judge our actions as being helpful or unhelpful by, in all sorts of ways. So these, these idealistic versions of what we should be have been practically useful for a human society to evolve but they are nothing but suffering inducing stories that's really what they are suffering inducing when you believe them it's great to be healthy it's great for a human organism to not take on too much food too much energy more than it needs because when it takes on more and more and more and more without using that which it takes on, it creates health problems. It creates pain. And it takes from the environment. It's not living in harmony with the environment. Right? And I, I'm one to talk. I'm an American citizen. I've got a nice big old booty. Uh, I consume far more than my share. But one thing that I have noticed as I've become more in love with this 
more identified with this rather than Michael Gunger, rather than this body, this dude, as being a separate somebody from the rest of it. But having my awareness rest on awareness itself, the peace of that has provided um, a sort of freedom with issues like this, issues like impulse control, what we eat, what we do with our sexuality, what we do with our time. The more at peace and at home we are in these forms, knowing that we're not just this form, but we're the whole thing, it it allows me to not need things so much. I don't need that extra milkshake to be okay. You know, I, I don't need to bury and medicate my pain under all sorts of coping mechanisms. That's something that begins to happen the more I love my body as it is the more I take care of it. Like, I never used to work out regularly at all. Um, you know, we, when I was a skinny, skinny guy, I would go to the gym occasionally, and I'd hate it. and It'd be a horrible time, and I would just do it out of some sort of, like, obligation or shame or whatever that I need to be doing it. And it wasn't until I became more at home with this and more in love with my body that I actually begin to work out regularly. And now I actually really like exercise. May not look like it with that aforementioned booty of mine, but I really do. I love going to the gym. I love feeling the sensation of my body being pushed beyond just sitting on a desk playing guitar, recording podcasts. I like feeling the energy move through the body and um, a funny thing about that though is with food, I also enjoy food a lot more. <laughs> I really love eating now too. Um, so, you know, the body is still balancing all of that out. Uh, but the suffering is not just about incorporating negative control mechanisms. It's about assuming that you're a somebody who can control this as though there's a Ryan in that body, a somebody other than that body and other than the context in which that body arises that can be like, okay, Ryan's body, this is what we're doing. Stop eating so much shit. And get to the gym. And the ego sort of takes the, the captain's chair and says, this is my ship and this is what we're doing. But it's not actually what's happening. <laughs> like the body is doing what the body is doing. The body is a bunch of muscles and tendons and bones. That's all basically reflexes to the environment. The thoughts that you're thinking, I should go to the gym were not conjured up by your ego. The ego doesn't get to think thoughts. The ego is a story. The ego is who you think you are. It doesn't get to do anything. It'll take credit for it. <laughs> like what the body does, the ego story fits that into its memory, into its pattern. It says, oh, look at that thought arose. That's my thought. Oh, look at this body ate that cookie. I ate the cookie. Oh no, I better feel ashamed. And it's a matter of identity. That's what this all is about. It's not a matter of morality. It's not a matter of spirituality as in you have to achieve some sort of other way of being. It's about identity. It's about you 
constricting your awareness to thinking that you are somebody separate from all of this rather than just being the flow that is all of this. And so whatever shape that body takes is the shape that it takes. And whatever it does and whatever it eats is what it does and what it eats. And you, well, you're not that body. And you're not some disembodied Ryan that's in that body. That's just a puzzle piece of the whole. And we can't find an edge to the whole picture. We can't find an edge to who you are because, you know, we feel like it's our skin. But you can't have the inside of your skin without the outside of your skin. You can't have your breath without the air in the atmosphere. And you cannot have the atmosphere without the universal constants of the earth floating around a sun, which is whirling around a Milky Way galaxy. All of that goes together. You don't get to the edge of this puzzle that is you. You find little pieces. But there's no, we can't find the edge. And when you assume that you are the puzzle piece, and you say, this puzzle piece is too fat. This puzzle piece is too whatever. Well, there's the suffering. And so, how can a body not suffer while still living in healthy ways? The body's going to live how it's going to live. I found, though, that the less my ego tries to be in the captain's chair and think that it's controlling what's going on, strangely, the healthier I do live. But it's natural, more like apples on an apple tree than Michael Gunger doing amazing things. <laughs> The fruit just arises. And what I found is that the less stressed I am, the less egocentric I am, the less fearful I am, and I just am, the more naturally virtuous I can be, the more naturally disciplined I can be, not as though there's an outside force imposing the discipline but more in the way that a tree that has already been growing in a direction continues to grow in that direction. It keeps growing towards the sky. If you're a person who cares about health, which you seem to be from your question, let health naturally arise rather than forcing it rather than pretending that you have control as an ego of it, but allowing what is to be, loving what is, rather than resisting it with fear and shame and the illusion of control. All right, good question. One more. This question comes from Dustin Hatfield, again on Twitter. How would you distinguish between non-attachment and just being detached? Well, Dustin, by detached, I assume you mean some sort of just aloof emotional state where things do not affect you, where you just sort of detached from the world in a way that you're not engaged with it. And that is a subtle difference, but an important difference between non-attachment and just being sort of casually detached. 
And here's what I think the difference is. I think the kind of detachment that you might be referencing in this question is actually an attachment of a different kind. A lot of times it's an attachment to peace and quiet. <laughs> to It's an aversion to conflict. It's an aversion to sadness or any of the emotions that we often consider as negative. And so as a coping mechanism, we don't allow ourselves to experience life. We don't listen to people. We don't allow our hearts to jump into the full experience of empathy, of mourning with those who mourn, of rejoicing with those who rejoice. Not because we're so in love with what is that we are allowing it to be what it is, but because we are so afraid of what is. I think that's the difference. I think non-attachment is love. Love seeing what is and loving it, saying yes to it in a way that does not clamp down and cling to its own selfish desires for this to be that, this to be something else. Whereas detachment is the opposite. It's a fear of what is and a turning of the head away from what is to stay safe in one's own little bubble that is more of the this that you prefer. And while that kind of detachment may avoid a certain kind of suffering, it may avoid more severe, acute forms of suffering, and agony, it still is a form of suffering itself because it's not a full, open-hearted, open-handed embrace of what is in loving awareness, but it's an avoidance. It's an aversion. It's a clinging to fear. Good question. All right, it's late. I love you all. I'm going to go to bed. I will uh, try to get another one of these next week with more of your questions. All the love. <laughs>